questions uh, should be asked by the uh, should be asked by the if the investor himself or herself before giving that consent. And I think uh, the first most important information is that why do I need this kind of information? Depositories, as you know, provide uh, information of holdings of every investor in his or her DMAT account. And there are uh, the mutual fund data, which is the non-DMAT mode, which is maintained by the registrar and transfer agents. So these are the first two use cases where SEBI has said that this can form a framework. And this will create a kind of a dashboard for an investor to know where he or she has really in invested. So one is that, why do I need this information is the first question which one should ask uh, itself before giving that consent. Second is to the extent this data and information is required. Do I need the entire gamut of information or do I need for a specific period? Third would be, would I need for all the stocks? Would I need for certain amount of stocks? As you can see, when I'm asking these questions, this is indirectly alluding to the fact that the system is intelligent and capable enough of ensuring that you don't need to ask for every information every time and consent on every information every time. You can be very, very specific as to what information you want or what period you want for what amount of uh, stocks you want and to the extent of detailing which you want, whether you want only the quantity, you want the quantity and the price. So there are various such uh, points which one needs to keep in mind before it goes on to uh, kind of uh, giving that consent to the financial information user uh, to draw that information from uh, the financial information provider, which are basically the depositories and the registrar and transfer agents. The second point, which I think is extremely critical, is that uh, you have to be responsible for your own data. So once data is got, uh, now we have a Data Privatization Act. The bill has been converted into the DPDP Act, which is an extremely important uh, measure of ensuring that the customer has full, uh, he, has, he is the owner and has full kind of authority for what his uh, uh, particular uh, uh, particular data which is there has to be provided or not. And for that, it is extremely critical to kind of ensure that once you give a consent, the data which comes to you, whether it is getting properly purged from the intermediaries and only people who are on a need to know basis needs to be provided with this particular information. Also, the act provides for a consent which can be withdrawn at any point of time, partially or fully. And the uh, people, the relevant stakeholders in the ecosystem are required to ensure that that consent has really been adhered to. So uh, it is opening new foundations, new uh, kind of areas where Customers will have access to huge amount of information and data, but responsible information collation is the need of the R. So one needs to understand the need of drawing this yeah. data and for how long you want this particular information. The third thing and probably the last thing which needs to be uh, really kept in mind whilst we are uh, kind of collating this particular information that the depositories, uh, both the depositories provide a consolidated account statement which is on a monthly basis. So the logical question which most people could have is that 
if I'm getting a cash, then why, what is the benefit of the account aggregator system? The answer to that would be that an account, a CAS is for a monthly information on a particular format and framework. Through the account aggregator system, I can get my raw information, raw data for a period which I want to, for the information which I want to. So there's a lot more flexibility in terms of how much information can be drawn. And that is the reason uh, uh, the account aggregator system is an important uh, feature to ensure that uh, these particular, uh, this framework is going to grow. And as new financial data points like your tax data, uh, the new market participants, institutions are going to grow. Uh, there is going to be a lot more flexibility which each of these, each of the clients and customers are going to have in terms of drawing its own data. But as we said, to simply really understand, to call for your own data, to repeat, you need to be A, knowing what data you want and why you want it. Be responsible that the data is properly purged when it's not required. And third is, to ensure that proper security mechanisms of giving consent, that nobody should be able to misuse that consent given by the clients to its financial information user is of absolute and paramount importance because finally, the system is growing and will continue to grow and we want to build it in a manner that it is built in a very, uh, with a lot of uh, faith and trust in the system and hence, Hence, it's important that every investor should know what their rights, obligations are before you start using the system. So I urge all of you to read and attend as many programs to understand the system in its, in its uh, completeness. And therefore, you know what all you're asking for. So with this, I'll kind of call it a close. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nehal. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, uh, it, it was a very uh, practical uh, speech, uh, you know, where you actually are directing people to do uh, the right things and how to go about it. Uh, uh, and of course, answering some very key questions that we think we were expecting in our presentation. So thank you so much for your kind words. And we really hope, uh, you know, we can grow leaps and bounds now with the depository information on account aggregators. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, uh, with that, now we move to our presentation. Uh, as always, Pragati is uh, divided, uh, the Pragati sessions are divided into main parts. The first part, uh, which of course started with uh, Nehal's keynote speech, will now go to uh, the presentation that we have made for all of you all to understand depository data type in the uh, account aggregator ecosystem. So we will go through uh, uh, some use cases and uh, uh, some more information on uh, schema, uh, the uh, how to read the schema and what can be the possible questions that can, uh, you know, that we one needs to answer uh, when you're using this data. Now this part, this presentation will be done by Sahamati in collaboration with CDSL. And the second part of the presentation today, the session today is going to include, of course, what we call as a natural call to action. We have a TSP spotlight uh, session with uh, Finarkin uh, showcasing their services to this industry. So without taking any further time, I'm going to share my screen uh, and start off the presentation. I hope uh, y'all can see my screen. Uh, yes, Prachi, we can. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this presentation is in three bits, AA ecosystem update, use cases and schema details and demo. Uh, we will go through a quick glance. There's an assumption that uh, the crowd, uh, the audiences are now aware of uh, the basics of account aggregator. Uh, we just, you know, for, for the benefit of uh, people who are probably slightly less uh, known to this, 
uh, there is uh, financial information users and financial information providers and consent managers in the form of account aggregator. All three uh, entities are registered and regulated by uh, uh, by uh, uh, one of the four FSRs, one of the four financial service regulators, which includes RBI, SEBI, IRDA, and PFRDA. I would request you all to put yourselves on mute, please. Uh, Ruchi, one... just Ruchi, yeah. one second. Just uh, change, uh, add me as co-host and edit now. So All right. Sorry about that. So, uh, yes, consent managers are uh, uh, regulated by RBI as NBFC AA uh, uh, license holders. Uh, now, on both sides, uh, like we said, uh, FIUs and FIPs have to be regulated and registered with one of the four FSRs. But uh, there has been a recent uh, upgrade. We also have GST as uh, an FIP in the account aggregator ecosystem as recent as a month or so ago. So uh, with that, uh, we are expecting more uh, FIP types to also uh, get included uh, now in the uh, uh, framework. If anybody has any questions on, uh, on this slide, we can take it up uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay, that's right. Now, uh, a little bit about how far we've come. We have uh, 1.13 billion bank accounts that have the facility of account aggregator available on it, uh, on, uh, on their accounts to share the data. As on August, we have 17.51 million successful consent-based data sharing. That has happened and we see a month-on-month -month growth rate of 27% uh, over the last uh, one year. Now, there are uh, 23 data types that are available in uh, account aggregator, the, you know, the schemas that have been released by uh, Rebit, there are 23 data types and out of that 15 are already live on the account aggregator framework. Uh, there are 86 financial institutions that are providing this data as FIPs and uh, of these 15, two also belong to GST, the GST R1 and 3B as data types. And with this, with these uh, 15 data types that are live, there are also uh, various new exciting uh, use cases that have gone live uh, over the last uh, few months. Uh, we credit being one of the biggest use case in the account aggregator framework in loans of all types, which is personal, home loan, auto loan, MSME loan, education loan. We've also seen, uh, we are also seeing use cases in uh, the uh, wealth management industry use cases in the pension industry and uh, uh, so basically across the spectrum uh, use case uh, new use cases are coming up uh, for uh, using data that is coming through account aggregator today there are 12 operational account aggregators uh, which means that there are 12 account aggregators who can open handles for customers who can create handles for customers and enable transfer of data and consent there are five more who are awaiting uh, their uh, license. So they are in principally approved and they are awaiting for operational license. Uh, now, this, we move on to, after the ecosystem update, now we move on to what uh, some of the use cases that uh, we think, uh, uh, you know, uh, businesses can uh, think of using depository data as part of the framework. Now, Today, as we speak, like we said, both uh, the depositories are live on the account aggregator ecosystem. We've seen a spike in the number of DMAT accounts linked in the month of August, July and August. So as many as 31,000 DMAT accounts have got linked, including CDSL and NSDL across uh, the account aggregators. This data includes uh, uh, accounts linked with five account aggregators and we are very sure that as the months go by, as the awareness increases and as the number of people get onboarded, this number is only going to grow. So what we are trying to say in this slide is that we see these 31,000 accounts linked and these 31,000 linked accounts are looking for these seven types of data. 
So 15 data types are live in the account aggregated account aggregator ecosystem and out of that seven can be accessed via the DMAT information alone including equity shares, ETFs, SIPs, uh, DMAT SIPs, DMAT AIS, IDR, CIS, INVITS. So seven data types are available via the uh, DMAT, uh, via the depositories that is through your DMAT accounts. Now, this is a one snapshot of uh, the use cases that we can think of, uh, which we are seeing after various discussions and we are seeing, uh, uh, you know, practical application in the various industries uh, or the use cases that can be created using depository data. So when it comes to onboarding, uh, we've seen three major types of uh, verticals that are using account aggregator ecosystem uh, data from AA ecosystem today. One is, of course, the advisory, which is wealth management and RIA uh, uh, vertical. Then uh, there is the lending uh, uh, the lending side, which is the credit uh, companies, say NBFCs and banks. And the third is the insurance vertical. Now, all these three, we, we do see depository information being very valuable in net worth assessment, especially in uh, onboarding stage of the customer. So net worth assessment uh, to uh, do complete evaluation of uh, uh, profiling and evaluation, net worth assessment to assess what kind of uh, uh, credit uh, the customer can uh, possibly avail of. And of course, net worth assessment in insurance as well. And uh, to also provide the right kind of product to the customer. So it does help in onboarding, onboard profiling, uh, profiling during onboarding rather. Then about underwriting and risk assessment, we see this as a use case, especially in lending. Uh, loan against securities is an already existing uh, business uh, in the uh, on the credit side, and uh, depository data, the data DMAT data that comes from the account aggregator ecosystem, from the account aggregator framework rather, uh, has lien marking available in it. And uh, this information can be used to ascertain uh, the amount of loan that can be disbursed to a customer, uh, you know, uh, from by the lender. Beyond this, we also see a big chance of a lender being able to use the uh, lien mark data to provide a combination of, uh, uh, you know, a, a loan that can be in a co combination format. So, for example, if there is a personal loan that a uh, borrower has requested for and as per the usual eligibility or, or underwriting uh, uh, mechanisms that a lender has, probably uh, the lender is able to allocate a certain amount of the loan requested. Uh, having data, having investment data uh, of the customer uh, uh, you know, pulled through account aggregator will probably enable the lender to increase his loan, the, increase the credit that he can give to the customer uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, probably match up or give more than what the customer uh, has requested for. So a combination of using the existing eligibility tools and uh, loan uh, and uh, being able to ascertain uh, uh, or rather underwrite via securities information that's available through account aggregator, a lender will be able to increase uh, the loan book for a particular customer. And of course, it can also be used as an underwriting parameter for uh, new to credit card. Now, 360 degree view of financial health, uh, one of the largest use cases that we see uh, for depository, of course, is with wealth management and registered investment advisors, uh, getting an overall view of investments of uh, uh, in various asset classes, whether it is debt, whether it is equity, uh, to be uh, to enable an RI or a wealth outfit to uh, advise correctly, uh, to provide uh, advice on asset reallocation, goal tracking, portfolio rebalancing, uh, uh, inheritance management, uh, and various other uh, aspects of advice uh, will be very, very, uh, there will be a huge ease of operation uh, if uh, DMAT data is available via account aggregator because account aggregator not just will give DMAT data, will, but will give data on investments, data on protection, data on uh, the banking data, cash flow, all of that in collaboration will help the wealth outfit to give up, uh, get an overall view and give the correct advice.
uh, analytics based on dematerialized data, uh, uh, getting data via account aggregator, which is not just limited to one type of data, which is not just limited to investments, but like I said, also protection, also cash flow will help uh, organizations create analytics tools. Now, analytics tools, uh, which we see in the advisory business can be in the form of risk profiling tools, uh, can be also uh, in uh, creating product bas baskets that can be a right fitment to a particular profile. Uh, so uh, getting all of this information, whether it's uh, mutual funds, insurance, et cetera, uh, in, a, uh, in an easy format will, and then, uh, reading it, analyzing it, and coming up with a tool that can actually further improve operations of the advisory business is where we see a huge application of uh, this data. Uh, on the lending side also, we feel that uh, depository data can be a huge input to a business rule engines which for credit limit revisions. So that's another uh, very important use case that we see on the credit side of the business. So that is about uh, use cases. Uh, like I said, we can take up questions and have deliberations and discussions on this in the uh, last part of uh, this presentation. We now move on to schema details and demonstration for which I would uh, request uh, Rachna from CDSL to share her screen and uh, take the audience through the rest of the presentation. Rachna, over to you. Sure. Thank you, Ruchi. Yeah, are you able to see my screen? Uh, that's why you'll have to do a slideshow uh, because right now it is uh, it's not showing the correct screen. Okay. I mean, it's showing the uh, notes on the right side. So if you do slideshow, you'll be able to. Sure, sure. One second. Thank you. Screen share. Uh, hello, uh, Rachna, if you click on those three dots, no, there, huh? no, no, just above and you click, uh, just click on the three dots, then you will get a ch option to say present a view at the bottom, just below your slide. There are three dots. Yeah. If you click on that and then say hide present a view. Thank you so much. Is it, uh, is it fine now? Yes. Yes, very clear. Okay. Yes. Okay, sure. So, thank you, everyone, and uh, good evening. Uh, today, I am going to talk about depository providing financial data in account aggregator ecosystem. Yeah. So, uh, as per RBI mandate and SEBI guideline. We as depositories are providing financial information to account aggregator ecosystem. We started working on this project last year when SEBI has uh, released the guidelines and we completed this project this year in month of April. Uh, So I will just talk about the stats of the CDSL 
just to give you perspective so uh, number one depository in india with the largest number of dmat accounts first and only listed depository in asia pacific region 73% market share in terms of dmat account opening in terms of reach cdsl has reached more than 9 crores dmat accounts covering 98% pin codes and more than 500 dps including 20 20000 plus dp locations we also have more than 18000 live companies onboarded with cdsl from the cdsl fip side uh, cdsl depository became the first sebi regulated entity to go live as a fip financial information provider so other financial information provided as we have seen like a insurance pension fund and recently gstn has gone live also on the a ecosystem also the the list of the live as with cdsl we have seen lot of requests coming from these as and this month we have seen significant jump in financial information being sought through a after we went live in april and i think that uh, ruchi also shared in his uh, uh, in his present in her presentation so so these are the live financial information type which cdsl is live with equity mutual funds etfs aifs invit reit etc as mr nehal mentioned in his speech of uh, uh, about cas and a so we i am going to give you a comparison for the data between cas and account aggregator so data collection perspective uh, data from depository and rta is combined in cas cas is a consolidated account statement which is which is uh, sent by depositories for transaction and holding of the investor so here the again in aa aa provides depositories rta and other investment type data also what we have uh, seen like pension fund or insurance so this is overall covering it frequency and period cas is generated on a monthly basis and a a ecosystem have an option of monthly yearly and even data updated as of yesterday also provides the option to select the date range a uh, format uh, cas is available in pdf and physical copy whereas aa sends the data to fiu in a electronic mode consent uh, cas is sent to investor as a process on a monthly basis whereas a provides real time data as and when needed and also with the explicit consent is taken at the time of data fetch uh information financial information cas has all the financial information types like equity mutual fund reit etc whereas uh, a does have all the fi types except the debentures and bonds which is currently in progress so we'll just talk about what are the prerequisite so here for depository perspective customer has to have mobile and pan customer to be registered with aa and customer with holding in cdsl dmat account with the same pan and mobile combination which is there in the dmat account so what is the process so there is a four steps i think what we 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 have seen for the others also customer account discovery account linking customer consent management and data fetch flow so specific few points which i just want to talk about is uh, here for depository related customer registers on a a platform using pan and mobile registered in a dmat account and he and she discover his or her cdsl account based on the fi type 
So suppose uh, uh, investor has a uh, holding in equity, mutual fund and uh, REIT, then at the time of discovery, the same DMAT account will show the three uh, tabs, which is equity, mutual fund and REIT. And so that, that kind of a discovery is uh, through the, uh, depositories. Customer account linking. Customer uh, links the DMAT account based on the FI type through OTP sent by CDSL FIP on an AA platform. Uh, customer consent management, customer to approve consent by send by FIU. And uh, with the definitely these consent parameters, uh, validity, uh, consent type, etc. And the final is the data fetch flow. Uh, FIU sends FI, FI data request with consent ID to pull the data. So uh, the data will have the profile, summary, and transaction. Profile is customer personal detail. Summary is uh, uh, portfolio value, Eisenweiss holding, and the transaction history for the transaction. Yeah. So this slide is just a key a field which we are, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, mentioned over here. Uh, and profile uh, uh, related to name, date of birth, mobile, nominee flag, which is, uh, you know, whether yes or nomination is yes or no, DMAT ID, landline, address, email, and PAN. In summary, the current value of the investment uh, issuer name, ISIN, ISIN description, closing quantity, and close price. For mutual fund, there are additional fields uh, like a AMC, registrar, lien units, lock-in units, and NAV date. So mostly the schema is same for all FI type. Only these mutual fund have uh, you know some extra fields, so which we have highlighted here. In terms of transaction start date and end date. This is the this is the date which uh, FIU sends a request for the period. Eisen, Eisen description, company name, transaction, type. Type is nothing but a buy and sell indicator. Transacted units. And here also for mutual fund, there are additional fields like AMC, registrar, lock-in unit, and NAV date. So, so in this slide, we have just put in the Excel just to uh, <coughs> show you the Excel schemas. Yeah. So this is how this looks. So first is a profile where the same of uh, same fields which we have already seen in the earlier slide summary and the transactions so one of the field like a order id which uh, which uh, we are uh, <coughs> we are sending as a transaction id as depository does not have uh, does not maintain a order id in the system Otherwise, I think uh, uh, remaining fields are the same. So here we will just give you a demo, a live demo. So here we just want to uh, show you the customer himself is how customer himself is requesting for the data and how is he is receiving it. So we have used the one money account aggregator. I will just, uh, you know, we'll just, uh, this is a login page of account, uh, one money account aggregator.
customer has to register but this uh, this mobile number is already registered that's the reason we are just sending directly the otp So this is the page where it says that uh, you don't have any linked account. So we can link the account here by searching CDSL. Uh, continue. Yeah, so here I, in the, you know, if you would have seen that the pan option was there, but I think this account was already linked. That's the reason uh, it has not come. So we have, if you see this 6648, the DMAT account number is the same, whereas this showing the FI types. So individual, who whoever wants to link, you know, the FI type, whichever FI type that can be linked. So here I am selecting equities and I am linking it. Ask for the OTP. So this completes the account linking process on the A platform. Yeah, so uh, we uh, we have one money app. We have used it for the FIU perspective. So where uh, FIU will for a customer will have to uh, put his mobile number and OTP to log in it, and then it move on to account page. So account page is where uh, you know this is the screen which is reflecting here. In the next screen, consent, here the, here the individual can click on here the consent request. Having some problem with this. Yeah. So then the next page comes as a consent approval, which has the all the consent parameters and individual has to approve the consent and then he or she will be able to view his balances and transaction. So this is the view of a balance uh, balance. Uh, in, the, in the first tab, you see the, there is a DMAT account detail number and the uh, FI type is mentioned. It also shows the current value of the holding. Profile, the name, PAN details are available. And also the holding perspective, it shows the uh, details of the script and the price and the unit. Yeah, so this is an overall uh, journey of a customer, how he can use uh, account aggregator uh, for the depository related uh, process. Yeah, so this is all, this is all we wanted to cover. Uh, 
thank you Rashla. thank you yeah uh, 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 you can stop sharing your screen Rachna, yes. so yes. okay so if anybody has any questions we do see a number of questions on the right side in the chat screen Rachna, you will be able to see it as well uh, please share the presentation yes we will share the presentation in the next few days when with the recording and the schema that Rachna has uh, presented to you all uh, there are this, there are some questions that have been asked on uh, the transactions which have been replied by either Geeta or me uh, Rachna there is a question on AIF uh, it says it's a long way to go to remat all AIF uh, to which we've responded that AIS are expected to get uh, completely dematerialized uh, soon, if there is. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So as per the SEBI guidelines, this has to be dematerialized, uh, I think, by March 24. Uh, Mar March 24, yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, any, so there is a question. Uh, until the CDSL consent is accepted, can you see it? It's in the chat box. Uh, I'm just scrolling, yeah. Uh, question. Until the CDSL consent is accepted, what details can we view of the CDSL DMAT account? Meaning, if I only approve the AA consent, can I only see the last few digits of the D D uh, DMAT ID, I think he means? Can I not see the broker name or other details? Mm -hmm. No, broker name and other details are uh, not part of a schema. So these will not be visible. And yeah, last four digit is visible of a CDSL account. But uh, Rachna's last four digit is at the discovery stage. When yes. the information reaches the FIU, it will be the complete DMAT end, right? Yes, absolutely right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what is the success percentage of these requests as of now and by what percent? Uh, not sure. I, are you are trying to ask uh, of the consents uh, successfully? Uh, I mean, what are you trying to ask of the accounts linked? The data that is displayed on the AA platform can be export the same in PDF or Excel. Uh, I would request you all to ask questions that are in relation to uh, this topic today. Uh, data that is displayed on AA platform can be so you will have to download a day. I I. I uh, highly recommend that you download a uh, AA app on your system and see what are the uh, AA uh, client features that are available uh, to a client, uh, uh, you know, on the app application. But for the purpose of this presentation and because of paucity of time, I would request you all to stick to questions that are related to today's session. Can you clarify on the registration by the, does he have to link the DMAT account the first time? Can you clarify on the registration by the customer on AA? Does he have to link the DMAT account? Yes, customer has to link the DMAT account and he has an option to de-link again and link again. So there is a functionality available yeah, on an so AA platform. Right. Also, that is a fundamental uh, requirement all, across all asset types in uh, for data via AA whether it is insurance policy, whether it is bank account or it is DMAT account or any mutual fund folio, a customer has to link it after discovery and then provide consent on any data fetch request. Uh, there is this question which uh, probably, Rachna, you will be able to take. Is information provided only for free securities? This has not That has not been encumbered. Both. It's a both free and encumbered both. The data is provided for both. I believe by encumbered they mean lean marked securities. Yes, 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 yes. yes. So that is a uh, account aggregator does give lean marked uh, uh, information, uh, security information as well, which was a part of. Right in the beginning, we mentioned it's part of the use cases. Uh, can we get this recording? Yes, you will get it on uh, YouTube. Request we show broker name at discovery stage. Okay. It cannot be expected from the customer to remember. Currently, AA for DMAT is for single holding or joint holding also in DMAT account. Rachna. So we are showing, a, a, for, we are currently for, it's for all, but we are uh, sending for a, the information for a primary holder. 
that is true also in case of bank account information yes. it's right now for individual and sole proprietor mm -hmm. and uh, so is it for dmat okay okay uh, i think we can take one last question uh, will there be any flag between free and lean marked accounts uh, you're on mute, uh, Rachel. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'm just reading one. Uh, sorry. So, uh, I have my IT. Dinesh, you want to take this? Yeah, yeah. Right now, we are giving this lean information for the mutual fund, and for equity, we'll give in future. So. Mutual fund uh, lean information is there for equity. We are going to give in a future, so that flag will come, but it will come after some days. Uh, I think uh, so. We are now uh, short of time. Uh, minutes. How does the recurring data collection take place? Can the user himself define? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Raghav, uh, we would request you to uh, probably write to us on info. This is a question regarding, uh, you know, uh, fundamentals of how the account aggregator framework works. We can take that up. It has nothing to do with depository information. Uh, is there a limit on data pooling? The limit on data pooling is also uh, different for different uh, types of data. Uh, so I request you to write to us at info. I'm writing an email um, uh, email ID here. Anybody who has any further questions, please write to us contact, and we will... The contact form is up, uh, added in the chat. Thank you most of that. Great. So Gita has added the contact form. Please write to us. Okay. So... Uh, Thank you so much, Rachna, for your uh, time today. And uh, I have a feeling there'll be questions after the session, which uh, we could take up jointly and, uh, you know, uh, reply to the audience. Absolutely. And thank you, Ruchi and the Samati team uh, for this uh, opportunity. <laughs> Your pleasure, Raz. Uh, so moving on now, uh, we will go to uh, the next uh, very important uh, session, very important part of our uh, of the Pragati session, which is the TSP Spotlight. So uh, as part of every uh, uh, Pragati session, we usually call it in our parlance a call to action. After you have learned about uh, a particular data type, after you know more about how as a business you can consume this data to provide your product or service to the customer, let us see what is uh, available by, by our uh, technology uh, service providers in the ecosystem. What is it that they have to uh, show to y'all in terms of a, a solution for uh, the industry? Uh, you know, and how y'all can use their solutions to, uh, of course, uh, achieve your goal of, uh, you know, uh, reaching out to your customers. So without any further ado, I will call Nikhil. Nikhil is already on our screen. Uh, Nikhil is the co-founder of Finarkin and uh, Finarkin has been in the AA ecosystem from, uh, right from its, uh, almost right from its inception. And, uh, uh, you know, so, uh, and they have uh, had, uh, so, uh, you know, services, uh, products and services across various different financial uh, verticals. So, Nikhil, uh, I will not take too much of your time and allow you to get, come onto the screen and get started. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ruchi and uh, Tachna and team CDSN for all the effort you guys have put in to uh, get, get this ecosystem off the ground and uh, glad to see the depository is coming through in a big way. I hope my audio is clear and uh, let me know when the screen is visible. Visible, yeah. Perfect. All right. Um, hi, everyone. This is Nikhil here from Punakin. I'm sure uh, we still have a bunch of questions lined up, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll try to keep this quick and short and to the point. And um, hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end to you know get questions. Awesome. So uh, 
I'm Nikhil. I'm one of the co-founders at Finarkin. We help businesses build data products on open data standards, create the account aggregator framework, or uh, you know the open health stack, and so on and so forth. So uh, you see a few empty boxes because you know we wanted to keep uh, the content relevant to today's uh, session, which is uh, repository data. And uh, what we do is one we have you know. Um, integrations and connections with various data sources, third party, first party. We like to stick to, of course, explicit consent driven data sources. And uh, our secret source is Flux, which is our workflow orchestration platform on which we've been able to enable our customers and their developers to build unique data products. So the way we look at it is that, you know, data is, is very unique with respect to how it is interpreted. Unlike other, say, you know, transactions, be it uh, workflows around identity or payments, which are fairly narrow and well-defined. Data is a whole different beast. Every individual and business, you know, even if I give you an Excel sheet or a CSV, you look at it very differently. And and to be fair, you know, that's that's how ultimately we, we differentiate, right, and build our processes. So that is what Finarkin as a company has gained into. We help you build data products, how you want it, where you want it, um uh, as soon as you want it right uh, we've been part of the AA ecosystem for a while now uh we are always super gracious of course Sarmati, with you know all the events they've organized over the years and um, we like to think you know we play a small part uh in in you know getting uh things going um be it the hackathon or uh, our recent samvad event or you know countless other events that have happened over the years so uh without you know taking up more time let me, you know, talk about a few specific use cases and offerings, you know, that that we brought to the market. So on the FIU side and on the FIP side, today Finarkin operates on either end. We believe that uh, with any two, you know, multi-party network, it is only as good as its weakest link. And uh, in in our case, more often than not, you know, um, I'm sure a lot of folks in the audience today are. Uh, either FIUs or, or you know, interested in in leveraging the depository data. Uh, but you know, as we've seen on multiple asset classes, uh, the journey on which we are on today, largely, you know, now the the conversations happening around better data coverage and better performance, right? So, what we need to um, also double click on is that as new data sources, BHGST or or you know, depository data, data comes to life, we need to make sure that the performance and the uptime and the availability of the data as well as the data quality is, is up to now. And I'm sure, you know, the CDSL team has put in a lot of effort over the last, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months to get that operation. Uh, so, but, you know, in case uh, any other organization is looking to, to ramp up, you know, their FIP infrastructure, today we work with around 14 odd organizations helping them uh, you know, build out their FIP infrastructure across multiple asset classes, their insurance and so on. So that's our product there. Um, we like to think it's best in class beyond just, uh, you know, plain vanilla API wrapper. We put in a lot of effort and uh, it's a fairly over engineered piece. And, uh, but, you know, coming to the beat of the session, let's focus on the data products that are applicable for use cases when you want to actually leverage data. Uh, we're talking about deposit data, not to be precise here. So we will, uh, you know, we have already gone through the journey, by the way, uh, uh, with the amazing demo that we saw with uh, with One Money and, and CDSL. And uh, what we have here uh, is is a quick view of the sandbox, you know, that, that we've built out. What we focused on over the last 45 to 60 days over the last few months was as depository data was going live, we were focused on trying to understand where does, you know, uh, value accrue with respect to how this data can be used. We are by no means experts on depository data. I, you know, me and my team, we have um, expertise in data infrastructure and building scalable uh, data products. So what we did was we wrote in, uh, at, you know, around 30, 35 odd individuals, um, you know, who were of two buckets. One was your casual, um, you know, investor or, or you know, somebody who's uh, occasionally investing and trading 
um, in in mutual funds and, and equities, and the other was you know the the, the trader persona, somebody who is an active trader, uh, who is you know um, uh, trading a couple of times a week, if not more. And there are different use cases and different um, scenarios, you know, uh, for for each of these personas. We've mm -hmm. gone really deep on on both of these personas, and uh, you know, before we talk about the use cases. Very quickly, I think, you know, let's just touch on uh, the schema. I think a couple of things are today uh, sort of missing. I think uh, more importantly, you know, the purchase information is, is today missing. Uh, and that's something that, you know, we are proactively trying to work on as to how we can work with the depositories and, and the ecosystem to also bring the purchase data. Because if we're talking about net worth use cases and and say something like taxation and capital gains and, you know, specific use cases, say, um, you know, tax of you know, harvesting and so on. All of that would require, um, you know, granular purchase information to really get it right, right? And apart from uh, the schema itself, you know, there are a few use cases. I think Ruchi touched on some of them, like uh, be it lending, wealth, uh, or insurance. But... Uh, you know, I think a better lens to, to look at it would be from the, the sort of personas we are going after. One would be the the investor and the other would be the trader. And, you know, these different personas would, would want to look at different scenarios and different cases. And ultimately, businesses such as, you know, uh, folks in the audience who want to leverage the security data would probably be serving, um, you know, uh, one of these profiles in different capacities. If you are, say, a lender, um, you know, you would have either an investor who wants to, uh, you know, get better leverage on their holdings or, uh, you know, you may be um, trying to serve an unsalaried individual who may be trading, uh, you know, full time as a living. So today these these profiles, these personas are, are excluded uh, or, you know, uh, the means to say underwrite or, uh, you know, deal with such customers is limited. And that's where we think, you know, there are strong use cases, unique use cases that can be brought to market. And, you know, this is precisely what we've been working on the last uh, 60 odd days. Um, so, so yeah, so let me talk about uh, two of those use cases. One is, you know, uh, one is a, a performance tracker across multiple DMAT accounts. Of course, a lot of these things. Uh, would need uh, the purchase information. So that's what we are banking on and you know, we're trying to work out uh, means to acquire, uh, you know, how we can pull in that information. But often, you know, people have multiple email accounts, especially the trader persona. So that's what we're trying to, um, you know, go after here. That's scenario one. And uh, where, you know, if, if an individual is... Um, having multiple DMAT accounts and is active across accounts, how do you bring a, uh, you know, like a combined uh, view across uh, multiple accounts? The other use case that, you know, we're going after is, is you know, uh, talking about the overall holding, right? I think this is a fairly vanilla um, use case. Uh, in banking, you know, folks call it unified password. Um, or, or, you know, which you mentioned something about net worth. Uh, whatever way you slice or dice it, you know, it comes down to how do you look at an aggregate holding of an individual and how do you ascertain, say, the net worth, right? And uh, wealth as an asset class is often, uh, especially now this is more leaning into the investor class who, who may have, you know, uh, passive holdings in the form of mutual fund SIPs. Uh, or, or of course, you know, the DMAT holdings. Uh, so ability to ascertain the current value, reconcile that with, say, um, other APIs, open APIs for, say, pricing information. And, uh, and you know, uh, we, we have roped in a couple of research analysts to, to figure out if, if you know, um, what are the third and fourth order sort of effects and the right information we can bring about beyond just, say, network. So that's the other use case which we're focused on for the, the investor persona. And uh, there are a few other use cases that we're working on. But, uh, you know, before we, we dive there, uh, I'll just very quickly you know, uh, touch on a few other points. One is 
we are a lead uh, and and you know fairly uh, you know scrappy company but uh, that only gives us bandwidth to work with only so many customers and uh, today what we are focused on is you know uh, the kind of use cases and the data products we built out for the security space we are now looking for fairly active uh, you know, uh, organizations who want to be early adopters and who want to be power users of the ecosystem and say depository data. If you, you know, uh, want to aggressively experiment it rate and figure out, you know, what works for uh, you guys, we would love to connect and, and you know, enable some of these use cases for you guys and get the ball rolling. Right. Um, so that's us, Finarkin. We help build new data products how you want it, where you want it. We work with over uh, 37, 38 odd organizations today across diverse use cases and diverse data sources. And uh, if you are thinking about open data standards, by all means, please do reach out. Um, our email is mentioned there. I'll also put in, um, you know, my contact info on the chat. And I would love to take up a bunch of questions uh, for the next 10 minutes. Please, by all means. Um, Thank you, Nikhil. Um, I think there are a few questions on the right side. Are there? If anybody would like to ask any question to Nikhil. You can actually unmute yourself and if you wish to ask, you can ask. Yeah. Uh, hi, Nikhil. This is Irfan here from Kotak Mahindra Bank. Uh, I just wanted to understand what are the use cases that you all have developed or the products available for corporates? Whether it is, uh, you know, this, I think I felt most of the products available were for individuals. So other than GST, is there anything that helps us to evaluate a credit of a corporate or so or a partnership firm? Uh, so, if an amazing question, uh, that was one of the blank boxes which I had not mentioned. But uh, we are working with uh, with uh, you know one of our leading uh, uh, investors who are active players in the uh, wealth management space for the corporate treasury. Uh, so, I, so, on the corporate treasury ability to to pull uh, you know diverse data and and you know provide a, a CFO. Uh, dashboard that's the initial iteration to just provide aggregation of information from a, a business uh, you know holdings perspective across uh, the mat asset classes right so the cfo dashboard is the anchor use case there to begin with and we will then move into uh, with the right inputs uh, from regulated entities into the essentially the advisory space which is what uh, typically uh, is the core um but you're right, today the scope is limited towards, um, and I mean, Ruchi can add here, we're still waiting for current account information, we're still waiting for a bunch of the corporate beyond the sole prop, uh, you know, sort of data sets. So uh, I think the timeline for asset classes to come, you know, beyond individuals and sole prop is unfortunately something I cannot comment on because I've been going uh, quite a few times with timelines I've committed to. Uh, but uh, please, Ruchi, if you have some would I be right in saying that from a bank perspective right now, only GST is the applicable tool for any lending? So I would say, how creative do you want to be? Right. <laughs> I think that is where the, the restriction would be uh, with respect to the current processes. Are there workarounds and, uh, and you know, other means to to go out and write a business, I would say yes, and I would love to connect with you offline to you know discuss some of these things further. But um, on the surface, you're right. If I want to pull data about a business today from the, I think GST is is the only data point. Yeah, GST from a business and invoicing perspective, uh, perspective, and of course, all proprietor data is available. Banking data. Yeah, but non-individual joint account types, HUF, all of this data type is uh, awaited from uh, the regulator. Any other question? Yeah. We have one question in the chat. Uh, 
uh, let me okay. just read that out from uh, uh, so how are you helping amcs and lending businesses with this depository data on aa any live use case would help us understand better so uh, sir i would say with respect to live use cases for on depository data um, we do not have a live use case today. at least at Finaka. I'm sure there would be a couple of companies in the audience who are live use cases around AMCs and I think that being said, we are working with uh, four AMCs today and uh, we are working on some of these use cases that you mentioned. So let me, uh, if you can drop me an email, uh, you know, let me connect with you and, and you know, do a deeper dive on the use case because I think take uh, more than a few minutes to. Uh, Raghuraj, uh, there was uh, uh, there were some screens that were shown by CDSL in their uh, in their presentation. We will be up to up to sorry for the tongue twister. We'll be uploading uh, the presentation and this recording uh, onto our website. Uh, maybe you can go through that, and I would also highly recommend that you. Download uh, AA apps. Uh, so uh, the live AA list is available on our website. I'll put out the link here. You can download the apps and go through, uh, you know, the entire flow yourself. If there, if anyone ha else has any other question, we are ready to take it for the next two minutes. Okay. Uh, Nikhil has put his email ID on the chat box. Uh, please reach out to Finalkin if you wish to. Uh, we have also put our email ID in the chat box and uh, Geeta has put the contact form as well. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us for anything to do with uh, depository information on account aggregator. Uh, we can discuss, we can deliberate and uh, we, uh, we will definitely get back to you if we uh, have an answer. And uh, for anything else uh, in the account aggregator ecosystem as well, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, with that, I think uh, we are coming to the close of this session. Uh, uh, we are a little before time this time. Uh, a big thank you to CDSL, to Mr. Nehal, uh, to Rachna uh, for uh, taking the time out and uh, uh, one, giving their point of view and also explaining to our audience what it means to have depository data on account aggregator ecosystem. Uh, we will be definitely doing more of these sessions uh, as uh, as there are new data types available. If there is an enhancement in the schema, uh, we will be doing uh, the, a, a refresher session as well. Uh, please be on the watch out for uh, the these Pragati sessions that we do with uh, Insahamati. Uh, register yourselves and I would urge you all to attend because these are... Uh, uh, deep learning sessions uh, from market experts and experts within the uh, within the domain. So uh, thank you so much for attending, and uh, uh, we will uh, definitely get back with our next uh, topic uh, in the next few weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nikhil, for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Yes, so web of the recording will be shared. Uh, look out for it on our website. Uh, in the coming days, it will be shared. Thank you. Also, it will be on the YouTube. I think you should sell our YouTube of it. it the website uh, has a link to the YouTube. So it starts with a blog yeah. and then it goes to YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I would... Uh, Raghav, I would request you to write to us on info. We will add you to our uh, mailing list and send you the event invites as and when we uh, plan and we disburse information. And otherwise, you can uh, you can please uh, watch out for what's happening in the AA ecosystem on our website. It's a single repository of all information, whether it is anything to do with data types, any intelligence, uh, any dashboards, or even events that serve uh, Athena. So, uh, yeah, I would suggest that you uh, keep the website or put it on at least once a day. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So I'm ending the meeting here. Thank you again.